Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Um, today uh, I'm joined by my good friend James Doyle and we're going to have a chat about a particular philosophy that interests us both and that we've both been attempting to follow perhaps to differing degrees of success over the past couple of years. Um, but I'm just going to get started now and I have a few questions for James. Um, so I guess the first question that I'd ask you is um, if somebody, somebody was to ask you what Stoicism is, um, how would you go about answering that question? Uh, yeah, it, it's a difficult one to kind of put into a few words, but for me, it's um, just differentiating between what is inside and outside your control. That would be the biggest thing. Um, uh, being able to differentiate between the two of those has been a, a massive, or has had a massive effect on my own life. And before that, I'd never really thought about something like that, and not not something you taught at school. So um, when I first read my first little bit of Stoicism, just going through something as simple as that, I was just like, "Wow, that it kind of it, it's quite empowering." Just knowing that you can put a lot more focus on what is actually in your own control, as opposed to worrying about all the trivialities of everyday life that you really have absolutely zero control over. As well, uh, one thing I noticed whenever I first started reading into it is that it nearly runs um, completely counter to what you're taught colloquially because we're almost encouraged and told to react in an emotional manner to external things. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, th that, that, that's definitely a thing. Um, I think like we've had conversations about this before. And it always kind of centers around sports because I think the two go hand in hand. They're both obviously uh, centered around two things that we would uh, have, you know, a big interest in. And I think that's what we kind of bonded over when we when we first met in university. But um, yeah, I think when it comes to passions, emotions and impulses, they're kind of seen as they're nearly glorified in a certain way um, mm -hmm. and feeding into those is almost encouraged, um, whether that be on the sports field or whether that be elsewhere, whether politics or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And when you kind of break it down on a surface level, that's all well and good. But when you actually read into it a little bit more, like there's not really much to glorify in feeding into impulses. And if anything, there's a, it can be quite quite detrimental to your own life when you continue to do that because. I think you, you, you go further and further down those rabbit holes. Um, and unfortunately, it's very hard to kind of kick those habits then. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, impulses are something that you should really inevitably not try and ever, you know, feed into as best you can. Yeah, absolutely. So, so going on from that then, would, would you say that, um, would you say that stoicism would be a good crisis management tool? as opposed to, say, having an approach to crisis, crises that are based more following your impulses? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one of, my favorite, one of my favorite things about Stoicism is that they place a particular emphasis on people um, being able to rely on the wisdom of, you know, the people that have come before them, the predecessors, as opposed to you know just relying on your the wisdom from people around you and I, I think there's there's a lot to gain from that and you have to remember that i think a lot of people are put off by stoicism because of how long ago that it was kind of founded how, you know zeno city and founded uh, over nearly close to three thousand years ago mm -hmm. um and it's something that's kind of stood the test of time and it's gone in and out of fashion but it's, it is kind of finding a foothold in modern society again. And we, we were only talking about this recently. But I do think the reason for that is because particularly it seems to appeal to men quite a lot. And the reason for that is that it doesn't really seem like in the modern society that there's many coping mechanisms um, by which men can actually, I suppose, turn to in times of crisis. Um, so I think... Stoicism is something that, for me personally, I always go back to when I have some sort of, you know, moral conundrum um, or deliberation in my own mind. And I think being able to go off timeless wisdom is 
it, it proves to be invaluable. Yeah, I would totally agree on that. And just to just to um, think further about the the point you made there about men, um, I, I I would say that perhaps it, its attraction to men is based on the fact that, um, despite the fact that uh, as a society um, there's very little talk. I think nowadays, anyway, this is obviously my own opinion, but there's very little talk nowadays on imp- impulse control on reining back your emotions and assessing situations more rationally and critically. And I think that despite that, there's still an expectation on men to be able to rein in those impulses and those emotions in situations of crises. Mm -hmm. And because of that, um, men are attracted to philosophies like Stoicism to help them find the answer to those worries that they have and nearly to meet the expectations that people put on them. I don't know what to think about that. You know, you could you could put a question to anyone like, where else are you going to find those answers? Yeah, uh, that's 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 kind of what you just have to break that down. Uh, it's quite simple because uh, I know personally that I don't know where else I would have found answers like that uh, mm-hmm. because you certainly don't find it in modern modern day media uh, mm-hmm. or you know from the news or from what is you know kind of peddled or pushed towards you whether it's in university or in school you're you're never taught to kind of I suppose break down your own emotions and thoughts and not only that but to logically think about them and to basically seem like you know break down whatever you know misconceptions that you may have about whatever it may be Mm -hmm. but you're not you're never taught those tools so how then are you supposed to uh actually deal with anything like that it's, it's very hard so i think for me anyway it was just pot luck mm-hmm. that i i came across what i came across and um, because i i don't think and i, I think I, i've said this to you before that the, the the kind of mind frame that i was in when i came across this as well i almost make it sound like a religion sometimes but it had such a big impact on me that it, it almost could be you know like that um but when I came across it, if you had told me anything about philosophy, I just would have, I would have cast it aside because I, just, I wouldn't have thought that it was something that was for me. And that's probably just because I would have been closed off to it. But um, yeah, I think it's essential to be open-minded and to actually just, you know, actually be able to delve into something like that and go in without any, you know, uh, preconceptions or, or judgments about something and just actually give it a crack and you know maybe for you it may not be um no i i would i would totally share share that notion um i mean for me philosophy prior to prior to discovering stoicism um i would say it was more so something that yeah i was interested in but it was more so something that you you would read about and follow in academic pursuits and not something that you would actually apply or think about applying yeah. to your own life. So I think that's where the big difference lies now. Um, and following from that, and I'm not sure if you ever, you've ever thought about this point, I've thought about it a little, but I've actually struggled to come up with um, any sort of concrete answers. But do you think that there's any, where, any place where, say, um, Stoicism and religions like Christianity overlap? I think throughout the Stoic literature, there's many different, um, I suppose, yeah, the, the, they certainly do seem to cross paths mm-hmm. in, in many different aspects. They talk about gods quite a lot. Obviously, when this all came to fruition back when it was first founded, there was still a large uh, emphasis placed on gods, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. particularly in Roman times. Um, and that was brought primarily because Stoicism was brought over by, from the Greeks. Mm -hmm. um so yeah i think yeah it's something that for me i see many similarities between certain religions and stoicism it's something that i only seem to kind of put the put the um put the dots together recently probably in the last six six months or so where i did start to see a lot of the values um that was kind of encompassed within religion, particularly Christianity and, and Catholicism purely because I was raised as a Roman Catholic. So that's my experience. Um, so 
I look back on it now and what it, I thought was, I suppose, all quite trivial and, you know, a little bit airy fairy, but a lot of, a lot of the, two, the two of them seem to actually really intertwine quite a bit. And I think there's a lot of good, and obviously it's completely open to interpretation and also it's, uh, it's everyone's opinion to have, but at the same time, I do think that there's a lot of good that can be derived from religion, particularly in values. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely agree. Uh, I mean, w- one, one place where there is certainly overlap between the two, I think, is the concept of memento mori, um, which is probably a harder concept to try and explain to people who aren't familiar. Um, it's with, the hardest concept. It's yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, but I think that essentially the main overlap is the fact that in Christianity and in Stoicism, there is that that pronounced emphasis on maybe maybe I shouldn't say meditation on depth but on death, but um, essentially not being completely not it shouldn't be something that you should push to the complete to the complete back of your mind. It's something that you should um, think about and carry with you because it in in that sense it's actually it's actually quite liberating and it actually helps you and point your life in a good direction i think absolutely i i think there's there whatever has happened with with the modernization of society particularly it seems um with the moving away from religions particularly and i know for us anyway in Mm -hmm. this region in ireland there has been a societal move away from religion and it's almost like taboo to talk about death as if it's like oh that's so morbid it's like I, I never understood that anyway. I, I, I was never one to shy away from talking about it. And um, I think it's, it's a vital part. You know, uh, the Stoics always talk that, or they always say that, you know, we're all born to die. And it's something that is, it's just integral to life. And you can't have life without death. And I think it's something that not many people do talk about. But the Stoics talk about it quite a bit. And for me, it wasn't just that, like, it's not something that you should push to the back of your mind, but you should actually keep it at the forefront. For me, it was something that it was a push to do better every day. Mm-hmm. And it was basically, it, it was almost used as a catalyst for me to be able or enabling me to be able to live as best I could do from day to day, because it's very easy when you get caught up in the trivialities of your day to day life mm-hmm. and all of these things that go on whether they're in your control or not in your control to completely lose sight of what is important. And it's not that, Oh, we're all going to die one day. It's that you're alive today. So make the most of that. Be, be thankful, be grateful and make the most of every moment. And like, unfortunately that, you know, that has kind of a a bad rap now nearly because it's seen as corny, but like, it's it's true so um mm-hmm. it's it's a massive concept in stoicism and it's something that i think is is fundamentally important and should be talked about in in modern society a little bit more yeah yeah i mean absolutely because unfortunately whenever um situations arise like like the current one we're in with the coronavirus for example I mean, I, I would hazard, you know, I'd have to say that there's, there's probably very few people who can say that they were, you know, fully prepared for the, for the devastation and the, and the panic it was going to cause. But I think that um, encompassing, you know, a, a worldview and a mentality where you consider points like memento mori, points where you, you know, meditate on, you know, the, the, I guess the, the larger structure of meditating on things going wrong on things like death, I think it helps to prepare you and act as more of a bulwark against the shocks that come from um, situations that, that can arise which are out of your control. Absolutely. Um, I think like a massive concept within Memento Mori is, you know, premeditatio malorum, which is, uh, you know, the, the, pre- the premeditation of evils. And I think that's, that's something that the Stoics do all the time, which is thinking about the worst possible case scenario and it's a way of, I suppose, preparing yourself mentally for what inevitably can happen 
or may not happen, but at least you're going to be prepared one way or another. Mm-hmm. But it, today it seems like there's, uh, I've never even, even like, you know, my grandparents or my parents or anyone in my family, I've never heard any of them talk about like anything that could potentially go very wrong in the world. But these things can go wrong. They have gone wrong. It, history is there, it, you know, it's in plain sight. And I think it's very naive. And as a, as a race, in terms of just the human race, we, we are very naive and we almost are always shocked by these things. And it's quite strange. Um, it's, it's quite strange because, you know, when so many things have happened before, all of what's going on currently has happened before. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's something that, it's not something that it's like, okay, well, because it's happened before, it's not a big deal. That's not actually the point that you need to grasp from it. It's the fact that we've been here before. So it's basically, you can take inspiration from the fact that we have gotten through it before. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know, you know, personally for myself, I wasn't prepared for this at all. Um, I, I think I knew things like this were on the horizon. Obviously, in what form, it's very hard to know. But, you know, there's, there's so many intricate details going on within, within the world now that a lot can go wrong and it doesn't actually take a lot for massive catastrophes to take place. So I think I very quickly came to grasp uh, the idea of this. And, um, you know, I'm lucky enough that I haven't had any fatalities happen within my, my immediate family thus far. So I suppose it's easier to have that mindset and to just be, you know, rather blasé about it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think it's an attitude that's certainly worth adopting because it, it's, it gives you, it takes a little bit, it takes a little bit of the power away from the pandemic itself and give, it feels like it gives you a little bit more power. Yeah, I, I, I to- totally agree on that. Um, it's almost like, there's a certain element of, of of hubris that exists in the sense that we think that, you know, we, we've, we've progressed too much. We're too advanced for, you know, to be um, at the mercy of, of, of nature and the mercy of, of, of things that have afflicted people who have existed before us. But then at the same time, you know, um, it is, it is in human nature and it is a difficult thing to, to meditate on whenever things are going well and it's all in the abstract. It certainly is a difficult thing to, to think about and meditate on. So, I mean, I, I, I try not to be my, myself, um, you know, too harsh and judgmental, um, you know, about others on that fact and, and on myself too, because um, <laughs> I, I find anyway in, in my life that I've learned I've learned the most when I've actually gone through situations. Um, so yeah, I, I always find that to be a, to be an important thing to consider as well. I don't know. I don't know how you feel about that. I don't know what, how you feel. I don't know whether you feel it, it, it's more of a, an issue surrounding hubris or whether it's, um, or whether it's um, something that's less negative than that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a tough one. Like yeah. there, there is a loss there's a lot of good that can be derived from situations, particularly personal growth, uh, that, that does tend to come out of situations like this. And I would completely agree with you that, um, I've stood to learn a lot out of particularly, well, the worst parts of my own like life thus far. Um, and I think a lot of people would be the same, but yeah, it's, it's a difficult question. I actually haven't really, I haven't really meditated on that at all myself. Um, but yeah, I think like it's it's a difficult situation for a lot of people, and I think it's very easy to feel very very I suppose helpless in this situation. But mm-hmm. there there there's a lot to be taken from, as I said, from from the past history, mm-hmm. um, that can give you a little bit of power in in these circumstances. And I think it's very easy to become selfish in a time like this. But I think it's one of probably the most important times to be selfless and to yeah. try help other people where you can, um, because there's not not a lot of emphasis being put on that at the moment. Because it seems like everything, particularly in Ireland, with all the restrictions and all the um, 
the restrictions on meeting up with people and you know coming into con contact with individuals it's almost enabling people to become more uh, reclusive mm -hmm. and become more secluded from society than ever before and i think it's uh, there's plenty of other ways that you know people can actually help other individuals going through this hard time um, and it's there probably needs to be more emphasis you know people are saying be kind but it's you're not really told like how, how can you do that and it's very hard like how, how can you do that when you can't physically come into contact with another individual um but i have thought about that quite a lot because it's something that the stoics talk about quite a lot and it's the the concept of sympath i always struggle with the word in uh, in latin sympath sympathia which is mm -hmm. uh, basically uh, the sense of unity mm -hmm. and being connected um and i know you know, a lot of, a lot of the tribes nowadays are the only individuals that seem to really reflect on, you know, uh, a connection to the land. And I think it's something particularly that the Western world have moved away from. Mm -hmm. um, but it's actually something I've delved into quite a lot since this pandemic has, has actually uh, come to pass. And it's something that I'm trying to get back to myself. Um, and it's, it's a very, it's a very good concept. And I think it's, it enables people to be a lot more selfless mm -hmm. um, when you think about a lot more than just yourself. And I think during a time like this, it's very easy to get bogged down in all the things that you can't do. But I think it's, it's quite empowering to be able to focus on the things that you still can do. And there's still plenty we can do. So that's a completely roundabout way of getting, getting to your question, but I'm kind of just uh, spitballing here. No, I, I mean, they're all, they're all very good points. And it actually, um, it kind of made me think as well of um, have you have you ever seen the Dark Knight? I have indeed. And you you know that um, that quote that uh, Heath Ledger's Joker makes about how whenever society faces a stress, whenever I think he's talking to is it Inspector Gordon? Yeah. And he, yeah, and he, he, whenever he says that whenever there's any sort of stress, the first thing that people will do is turn on each other. Yeah. And I've actually seen a lot of people share. Um, share that as kind of like a meme over the past couple of weeks but like I think why that movie resonated so well at the time and, and why it's coming back to people now is back then whenever there wasn't the kind of stresses that we're having now um, it probably did seem like something that was more abstract and now people are coming to realize that hold on this is how we've seen like just go down to your local supermarket you know, or even a couple of weeks ago, just go down and have a look and look at and see how people are behaving. And you'll see that there was actually truth to that. So I guess that if if we do, you know, as a people, start to encompass the whole the 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 concept of sympathy, of of looking out for each other, of being kind and helping each other as best as possible and not being reclusive, it, it acts it definitely does act as a bulwark. Um against that kind of mentality mm. and obviously that may sound quite idealistic but i think it's such a worthwhile goal to to strive towards and to try and help as many other people around us understand as well well i think personally from my own experience it's a lot easier to be selfish <laughs> yeah. uh, it takes a lot less effort you know um and it's it's something that I have found difficult at times because it's very easy during these times to get bogged down. And it is because you feel like you're restricted um, because you are physically. But I think that also kind of seems to seep into your mental attitude. And when any individual, I think it, it fe I feel like it's almost human nature. When you're restricted to any degree, uh, it just seems like it just doesn't bode well with anyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and I think that's, that's probably because we're we are so unexposed to anything like this before that it just hasn't sat well with so many different people. Yeah. Um. But I think yeah, like the sympathy aspect is something that's it's very interesting. But everything is interconnected, and I think the more emphasis you can place on that, um, the better. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think since we're talking about stoicism, a really really important thing to talk about is um the concept of self-reflection and journaling because yeah. because while we're um talking about a lot of these ideals 
maybe to some people it, it could come across as slightly um, puritanistic and maybe uh, overly moralistic and altruistic. But yeah. I think what people should really understand about Stoicism is the first person who you should always criticize and review is yourself. Um, and that's normally encouraged through the medium of journaling. Um, well, how, what do you think about the whole um, concept of self-reflection of journaling and have you found that it's helped you? Yeah, so I started journaling the minute I got the Daily Stoic, which was uh, Ryan Holiday's book. Um, it was uh, a venture with uh, Stephen Hanselman and also Tim Ferriss. So the three of them came to, came to basically compile um, four of the key kind of main tenements of stoicism uh, for individuals and they they created this book and it's a compilation of quotes and it came along with uh, with an accompanying journal and it helps because it's just one quote a day so it's it's one a day journal and you just you have an evening and a morning passage and you can just fill that out so i've been doing that probably for the last i started in november of 2017 i think so yeah, I've been doing it since then, and like it's it's one thousand percent changed my life. Um, there's no other way of really putting it. Um, I had never done anything like that before, and never had a journal or a diary or anything like that. Like, you know, if I'm being very honest, it, that was something that certainly would not would have been frowned upon, <laughs> you know, um, as a as a young guy, um, particularly where I live. Like, if you if you were like maybe that's that's um you know pointing to in, an insecurity but i just know that's that's me being frank about it um back then it would have been certainly frowned upon so doing something like this was certainly new for me and it it was quite strange at the beginning but i don't know what i would do without it now and when i i notice straight away if i have been unable to actually be able to journal and it's not just about stoicism you read the quote of stoicism and you try to apply it to what's currently going on in your own life or what's going on or what's going on in your surroundings. And I think it is for me anyway, it's allowed me to rationalize many irrational thoughts mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, um, something could happen to you and you could put it down on paper and, in the moment you could be purely subjective and filled with an impulse and emotion and you know you can say the wrong thing so instead if someone sends me a message that i don't like i put the phone down and i'll go journal about it and mm -hmm. generally i will come back with a far more objective response then which uh, is a lot more well-rounded and you know i have certainly i've certainly um, I suppose prevented myself from getting into positions of uh, you know awkward conversations with individuals that I used to get in all the time because mm -hmm. um, you know I would never just back down from someone saying something that I didn't like but now I, I do I certainly pick and choose uh, with what I want to get involved in and I try to diffuse situations as best I can mm -hmm. and stoicism is is a is a really great tool for anything like that mm -hmm. and, and it's almost as if um say you're you're out in your day-to-day -day life and something bad happens to you or you find yourself in a situation where you're speaking to someone and you've said something that you find embarrassing or something that that you feel may have came across came across too abrasive or too weak or whatever way you want to perceive it, it it's if you don't i find that you know before i started journaling about things like that it's something that you would carry with you a lot of the time it's mm -hmm. something that it's like a frustration that would nibble away at the back of your head and it just would it, it it just would kind of you kind of forget about it at the time but then it would come back every so often and i find that with with journaling and with re reflection it allows you to confront those things that can cons consistently bother you and it gives you a means to actually take them take them on head first absolutely um i think there's there's no benefit to pushing things to the back of your mind and I think is like obviously it happens with females as well. And there's mm. like stoicism just the way obviously to go back to my my one of my first points, stoicism doesn't just apply to males. I just mm. think that males have been inclined to go in that direction because there's less sort of mediums by ways to, you know, I suppose, express yourself. Um and 
particularly guys aren't as expressive within groups of guys you know mm-hmm. girls talk a lot more than guys do and that's obviously that's a blanket statement but by and large anyway that that would seem to be the case um one of my favorite things about journaling and what puts it into perspective is uh, Seneca stating that you have to put your day up for, for review mm-hmm. and how can anyone get better in any facet of life if you're not putting it up for review? Mm-hmm. So at the end of your day saying I did this well, or I did not do this well is the only way you're going to be able to change that going into the following day. And if you're just, you know, it, it kind of goes back to, you know, um, trying to do the same thing over and over again and expecting different results it, it's not it's not it's never going to reap the rewards that you want and I think that if you're not putting things up for review it's like a sports star reviewing a performance of a match it's essential for moving forward and getting better so why I think he even said this back then which is two you know close to over 2,000 years ago um that people weren't doing it back then and he thought it was you know blasphemous for people <laughs> not to be put in the, to not to be putting their day up for review and i think that's even more applicable nowadays mm-hmm. yeah absolutely i mean um again it comes back to the point that isn't it isn't it wasn't it albert einstein who said that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting things to change <laughs> That's that's the awful. That's yeah. My, I did an absolutely awful job of trying to rehash that quote. <laughs> but I that's think exactly that's what, what I think I was that was the quote. Then. That was the quote. It was <laughs> yeah, and it is. It is you know, um, expecting different results from doing the same thing over and over again is insanity. Um, but it seems like most people think that way. Yeah, and most people think like, you know, you have an issue like whether it's you you got you got quite angry at an individual or you know you decided to tell a white lie but mm-hmm. it's just like people think they can just get over these things but like they don't do anything they don't actually they don't take any actionable steps to addressing it yeah and without without doing that you're just setting yourself up for failure mm-hmm. and you know um for me there's many different facets of my personality like i used to tell white lies um you know and I used to just do it in quite a nonchalant fashion and it could be about very silly things but when you actually think about them then they're they're rather insidious in nature whether they're big or small and the more I delved into that in my journaling I was like god white lies are just as bad as lies you know mm-hmm. um but without doing that I never would have thought that mm-hmm. because I feel like you can't come to those rational you can't come to those that kind of uh, rationalization in your head it has to be on paper yeah. Um, and I think it, it helps massively with me. And it's the same as um, one of my favorite quotes in the Daily Stoke is about how anger is a bad fuel. I'm just talking about two completely different, um, completely different facets of what I would have thought about myself previously and that I used to be a little bit of a hothead. And um, I always thought like anger was a, was a good way of, you know, fueling yourself because it, it, and it certainly did get me to, to a certain extent that it would push me to do things and better myself, whether it was to spite someone or whatever it may be. But it, it's it's something that from stoicism, I learned that anger is an extremely bad feel uh, for many different reasons. And um, unfortunately, it, it seems to kind of, you know, lead down into the abyss if you if you can tr- continue to try to pursue that as your fuel. Um, but that's just two kind of random examples of mm-hmm. what I've gotten from journaling. Um, and that's just off the top of my head, but there's, yeah. there's so many of them. Just to um, delve deeper into, into one of those points you made there, um, I, I, some people have said that anger is a, is a good means of combating fear. Um, what do you think the stoic attitude to combating fear would be? Well, I certainly know that anger would not be the way of combating fear. Um, I think fear is something that it's, I don't think it's something that you can completely look to eradicate. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that you need to be able to come to terms with. And that's what I've read up about the Stoics and them talking about fear is that it's something that they feel like you can deal with fear and the person who is brave is the person that can deal with fear, but not have no fear. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, 
that's a large differentiating factor there because when many people would kind of you know look up and they would think of an individual as being brave it's that person of not having fear Mm -hmm. but that's not actually the case it's the person that can confront the fear and not run away from it Mm -hmm. because everyone's going to have fear Uh and so for me it's one of those things that when you can kind of just actually take a seat and just say yeah okay like everyone's going to have fear you're never going to eradicate that no matter what the setting is whether it's standing up and in public and saying something to a large crowd or whether it's confronting you know an awkward conversation that you need to have at home like you're always going to have that little bit of fear and i think it's just one of those things that if you can persevere and actually go through it and that's one of the large uh, i suppose cornerstones of stoicism is perseverance and i think that also applies to fear in my eyes anyway um as opposed to just having the idea because that you you can eventually get to a stage where you just don't fear anything because I just don't think that that can actually, that's not attainable in, in no. my opinion. I, I find that, you know, um, looking at how I've approached fear in different situations that anger can be a good short term um, means of attacking and getting over an initial fear. But it certainly, it certainly isn't um, a good long term strategy because say, for example, you use the example of talking to a family member, an awkward conversation that you may not want to have. That's the kind of scenario where if you pounce into that with anger, you're nearly sure to make a situation 10 times worse than it really needs to be. Yeah. So I guess that the optimal approach there definitely would be an approach that it, that ensures that you are able to confront your fear in a rational manner and understand that it may not be something that you're able to completely eradicate but it's something that you're able to exist with yeah and and there's there's also another aspect of fear that some fears are completely irrational Mm -hmm. (laughs) and i think when you actually when you can think on them um that's you can completely rationalize some of them um, and some of them are completely irrational and I think that's another aspect that certainly should be taken into consideration that you should be able to differentiate between the two because mm-hmm. a lot of people do have irrational fears and I think when you can strip something back uh-huh. um, you know I know for both of us anyway with you know sitting the likes of legal exams um, you can have this fear about you know well, it's almost like an impending sense of doom um, when you're coming into like a big set of exams and it's like when you strip that back it's it's very liberating because it's yeah. like okay what am i really what's my worry here what what do i really fear here what's the worst possible outcome and that comes back to premeditatio malorum which is just yeah. i'm going to fail the exam okay that that's it that's that's the worst thing that's going to come out of this mm-hmm. i'm still going to be alive hopefully <laughs> you know <laughs> all things going well i don't have a heart attack because the paper doesn't go my way but like you know um, by and large you're going to be okay and you're going to come out yeah. the other side and i think that's something that's also really important and quite liberating um but yeah undoubtedly i think uh courage is, is something that is uh i don't know if, if it's if it's kind of given uh if it's kind of for me anyway from what i read throughout being in school and everything it's it seems like it's almost something that's unattainable but Mm -hmm. it's attainable um it there's just there's many different forms of courage yeah and courage is not being immune to fear Mm -hmm. (laughs) and i think that's something that's not really spoken about a lot yeah and courage itself you know it's the act of courage it's nearly given this like grandiose perception of being a literal um, knight in shining armor who goes and <laughs> plays a dragon, but you know, yeah. can be literally as something as as minute as you know, he- helping somebody cross a road who's struggling to cross a road, or yeah. even something as small as that, and or something that you may perceive as small as that, I should say. And I think that once you start to encompass that and and realize that the small actions that you take every day can can enter these um, near heroic scenarios. It, it, it does give life um, a, a, an excellent new purpose and meaning, I find. I don't know if you've had a similar thought pattern or experience as well. 
I do. Yeah, no, I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that, with that concept. Um, it's something that for me, being able to tell the difference between, you know, not having fear and being able to deal with fear is something that, as I said earlier, has certainly liberated me to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. And I think um, the grandiose idea that you talk about is something that I, I personally would have held in my mind for a very long time. And mm-hmm. it's something that I almost had to debunk because it was just like, that's, that's not realistic. Like, and that's, I think that's something that you almost just instinctively don't question. Uh-huh. You know? And I think that's also another large part of Stoicism is actually questioning things mm-hmm. and putting things up um, and, and testing them. Um, and I think that's, that's vitally important nowadays. And it has been in the past. And if more people had done it in the past, it seems like, you know, uh, bad things that have happened, you know, wouldn't have happened. And I think it's something that's vitally important for society. Uh, and like particularly you know democracy that yeah. people should be able to question uh you should be able to question things and i think it's it's something that should be um of the utmost importance it's like the 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 small acts of courage combined will eventually prevent one large evil act of terror or one absolutely. journey that will eventually subsume everybody absolutely I think that again whenever you start to perceive life and situations in that manner. There's nearly an obligation then to try your best to be courageous. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, you're right there. And just as, um, as a final question, um, where do you think the best resource is for people to go and read into Stoicism and find, find out more about it? A good starting point for me anyway was the Daily Stoic. It, mm-hmm. it is wholly digestible um, and very easy to read. So it gives you a small quote and it breaks it down in layman's terms, um, which is very useful to begin with mm-hmm. um, without having to get into, I suppose, some of the actual Stoic texts themselves. Um, but with that being said, they are certainly when you get to that stage they're certainly the best and uh the best pieces of literature that you can actually delve into mm-hmm. um the original translations of the likes of marcus aurelius's meditations the gregory hayes translation is like something that certainly changed my life and it's very funny uh, in the first few pages you just mm-hmm. you realize that an emperor who was the most powerful man in the world um back during a time that you would think people are so different in one of the opening pages talks about how he struggles to get out of bed in the morning. Like straight away, I was just like, God, this is unbelievable because it's just not something that you would think about, but it's, Mm -hmm. you know, he talks about how it's cozy under his warm blankets. And the minute I I read that, I was just like, God, this is, this is very applicable to me. And uh, Mm -hmm. I just continued to read. And from then on, I just kept up with stuff like that, but things like the daily stoic.com is really good. There's some really good articles in there. And the daily stoic has a YouTube page as well, which is, I would, I would highly recommend people to watch Um, and anything Ryan holiday. He's, he's how I got into stoicism. Um, and he, he would be a large inspiration for me. Yeah. Um, he seems to be a guy that, you know, was kind of caught up in the corporate rat race and basically took the executive decision to remove himself from that and you know pursued his passions and you know he was in a a very comfortable position it seemed and now he's doing what he loves and he's also you know embodying his philosophy which i think is is something that's really great it's it's very easy to say you're a stoic but it the stoics themselves are all about embodying the philosophy um, and living it and not just speaking about it. And that's the difference between Stoicism and other philosophies. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not about lectures. And that's the reason that it's called Stoicism. Because, you know, there's things like Epicureanism. And they're all named after the founders. Mm-hmm. Stoicism is different. And the reason it's called Stoicism is Stoicoicale, which is, you know, means uh, a porch. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason that it's called that is because it, the, the first lectures given by Zeno were on a porch. And I think that just goes to the very essence of what Stoicism, uh, I suppose, represents. Um, it's not about the individual, but it's about actually just being a better, better person. Um, but it's, it's something that I think is, is extremely useful. It's something that a lot of people could rely on nowadays. And 
I think it's a really, really useful tool. And I know that it's, it's certainly changed a lot of my perspectives uh, in life and has certainly made me become a better person. I'm not saying I'm a, a great person, but I'm certainly slightly better. Um, so I think it's something that I will seek to pursue for the rest of my life. And I think it's a very worthwhile pursuit, which is trying to attain as best a character as you can. And mm -hmm. that, that's one of my main goals before anything else. And yeah. That's purely from reading Stoicism. So That's great. James, that's a great answer. Um, and I hope people um, take that advice and go and seek out those books and read into it, even if they are just a little bit curious and see if it works for them. But um, James, thanks for the chat. And uh, let's do this again soon. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. It was really nice to speak to you. Anytime.